All right, we now get to look at the rest of our churches. And wouldn't you agree it's hard to be a light for Christ when you feel closed in by your own anger and frustration and disappointment and even unconfessed sin? When you and I as believers choose the darkness of our unconfessed sin, Jesus' light in us becomes hidden from the world. Like these churches that in, in Revelation, we have been called to be Jesus' light to the world. Repentance, it restores our usefulness as Jesus' light when our sin has overtaken us. Because when we repent, Jesus forgives our sins and his love shines brightly through us. In five of the seven letters, Jesus says, repent. Metanoia is the word. Repent, turn around, change your ways. In the dark landscape of Roman culture, you are my light. And repentance leads to revival. Will you please open your Bible to Revelation chapter 2? We're going to try to get through the rest of chapter 2 and 3. Will you please pray with me as we explore God's instruction to repent and then the implication for us. Mighty God, we long to be vessels that are clean and pure and used by you. Please use this, your letters to the churches to help us evaluate where our hearts are far from you, Lord, and repent in response and restoration relationship, Lord. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. God's love language is obedience. But we don't always obey, do we? Either we don't know what is right or we don't choose to do what is right. That's probably the, the more uh, thing we do most often, right? Wrong beliefs lead to wrong behavior, which is sin and that requires repentance. And repentance includes three elements. A conviction of sin. As we study, God will spotlight wrong thinking. Contrition, that's sorrow for our sin. And conversion from our sin, it means turning from it. Genuine relationship with God is elusive unless we etern intentionally reject sin. Here's an important point. Repentance doesn't save you. Repentance doesn't save you. In the midst of you and I being strangled to death by our sin, Jesus alone offers salvation. Jesus is in Christ. Our salvation is in Christ Jesus alone. Jesus says, cast your life on this truth. He died for you and me. He removed the eternal penalty of death for our sin. Jesus' resurrection assures all who believe in the gospel of Jesus as our rescue, our redeemer from sin, will be forever embraced by God. So does obedience make us right with God? No, no, obedience doesn't. That's what Jesus did alone. But the moment we cast our life on Jesus Christ by miraculous grace, we are in relationship with God. Our right response to Christ's incredible gift is obedience. God's love language, obedience to God, to God's commands. And when we don't obey, repentance is required. Repentance is the sign that you and I embrace God's plan for restoration through Jesus Christ. These churches and perhaps our churches today and perhaps you and me, we hold this misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin and that's just not biblical. True faith sets us on a new course. Okay, we're gonna go to the third stop in the circle of churches, the compromising church in Pergamum. Let's read Revelation chapter. 2 verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Now we remember that, don't we? From, from chapter 1, Pergamum was the Roman imperial cult headquarters. And do you know the Roman symbol for Caesar? It's the sword, the gladii, the, it's a sword image. It, pulling from Revelation 1, it said, I'm the one with the sharp double-edged sword. And Caesar has a one-edged sword. Jesus says, I have a two-edged sword. I justify and I judge and I save and I sanctify and I defend and I destroy. Jesus says, I know you feel imperial weight, but my power is incomparable. Jesus' power is incomparable. Pergamum is loaded with problems. <laughs> first, the first problem is, is the problem of the place. Let's read in verse 13. I know where you live. Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. It's where Satan lives and reigns. The imperial cult was satanic to the core. Imagine living in a place like that. 
Augustus Caesar demanded worship as God instead of the one true God. And so how does a Christ magnifying church ever thrive here? Jesus eulogizes one specific man. His name is Antipas. And he can, uh, because Antipas is safely in heaven, he's safe to mention by name. And this is one of those cryptic marks that indicates very intense persecution. Jesus called Antipas his faithful witness. That should put our minds back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Who else was called the faithful witness? Jesus, right? That was a description for Jesus. Jesus. Jesus honored this man who died for his faith in Christ by giving Antipas a new name. Jesus' own description, faithful witness. How are you being a faithful witness today? How are you preparing spiritually to face persecution? Pergamum's problem also had a problem with the prophets in verses 14 and 15. The Nicolaitans teach idolatry and immorality. Idolatry is the sin of treasuring anything or anyone more than God. And immorality is the sin of violating God's command. Anything contrary to scripture is contrary to God. Anything contrary to scripture is contrary to God. If you want to know what honors God, read the scripture. The, this culture embraces immorality and idolatry and if you're simply rejecting an idol, you're just gonna find another idol. And so what's the best response? It's to repent, to repent. Verse 16, repent while you have the opportunity. Turn from it, metanoia. If not, judgment is coming and I will fight against you. That, did you catch that? The God of the universe fighting against you, me, them, the unrepentant people holding tight to sin. God hates sin. God will fight against sin in our lives. In verse 17, he says, I will give some of them hidden manna. I'm also going to give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. See the thread of all these things? Uh, the, those who overcome through repentance, I will give hidden manna. Our minds, of course, go to Exodus and the miracles of the desert food provision. Jesus lifts the eyes of the Pergamum church. Of you. He says, you never have to sin to get what you need. You never have to sin to get what you need. God declares, I'm always going to provide for you. The white stones, they declare innocence in a court of law. They also, white stones were a ticket to the theater. And white stones were also uh, what enslaved gladiators risked the death, their death to fight for the white stone of Roman citizenship and, and their freedom. You might be shut out of your culture, but you are always welcome in the presence of Christ. You're always welcome in the presence of Christ if you believe him as your redeemer. Your stone ticket provides your citizenship in eternity. And so which community are you chasing? Worldly acceptance or eternity? If you search for identity and freedom in anything but God, you're going to drown in the sea of idolatry and immorality. You'll drown in the sea of idolatry and immorality. Jesus says, repent. Repent from things that terrorize and captivate you. Repent from those things. And when you do, tremendous things await. God will share life with you today. Manna, fellowship. He'll give you an eternal home. White stones. He'll give you a new name, just like Antipas. Faithful witness. Faithfulness to Jesus fuels the light of our witness for Jesus. Now verse 18 begins the letter to Thyatira. Think warrior image. Thyatira was a doorway to commerce. Numerous trade guilds facilitated commerce and social standing and they worshiped Greek Zeus, the warrior god, the warrior thunder god. In verse 18, these are the words of the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Yeah, we see a warrior, right? Pulling from Revelation verse one, chapter one, Jesus's eyes blaze fire, judging our impure thoughts. Jesus' feet of bronze helps us battle against sin. In verse 19, he knows their deeds, their love and faith, their servants and perseverance. In verse 20, nevertheless, we learn of a woman who Jesus nicknames Jezebel. He even protects Christianity's foes in this, in this hiddenness, this time of persecution. Even the foes are protected because it's so awful. 
In 1 Kings chapter 16 through 18, King Ahab had a despicable wife named Jezebel and she promoted idolatry and child sacrifice and immorality and the Thyatira and church leaders allowed this Jezebel to coexist and mislead the church. Have you experienced a time when compromise allowed evil to coexist with your church or your family? Sin takes you further than you want to go. Sin costs you more than you want to pay. And sin keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay. We have to repent of sin, turn away. Jesus warns of the dire consequences of disobedience and allowing sin to have any presence in our lives. Jesus explains there are consequences to an unrepentant heart in verse 21 through 23. Jesus will forgive even our worst sins, but Jesus will never compromise with unrepentant sinners. He is just because he's the one who knows everything about our hearts and our minds. His blazing fire, his eyes cut through any attempt to hide. Jesus invites repentance. Jesus demands repentance and Jesus forgives completely. He will punish those who don't obey. But in his mercy, he's given us today to repent. What do you need to search your heart for? Verse 24 mentions these deep secrets of Satan, kind of mysterious, wrong teaching about relationship with God. Wrong teaching about relationship with God. So don't be deceived by non-biblical ways to become more spiritual. Think of all the things that we have in our life to do that. God says, all you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. To him who overcomes and who does my will to the end, I will give authority to the nations. That's verse 26. That's so remarkable, isn't it? Jesus, the unbreakable authority, the iron scepter, will share his power with overcomers. He is the warrior and he is giving us uh, a power with him. Uh, there's a reference to the morning star, a, a reference to the end. To Jesus is the morning star rising to proclaim a new day. Every day is a new start, a new time to overcome by resting in the power of our warrior. King Jesus. Today's compromise on truth loosens our hold on eternity's promises. The Romans sometimes forced captives to be joined face to face with a dead body and eventually the horrible stench choked the living captive to death. That's what sin does. When you and I are sh shackled to a dead corpse, our sinfulness, sin does that to us. We are dying and only repentance frees us. So what are you holding tight to? Either you're holding tight to eternity or you've shackled yourself to a decaying world of stench. Now in Sardis, Jesus teaches the church to reject lifelessness. Think death and that's the vision for Sardis. Sardis was famous for gold purification and white wool industry and it had a preoccupation with death. Lots of grave sites. Chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in believers when he ascended into heaven. Sardis had the reputation of being alive, but they were spiritually dead. In verse 2, Jesus compares them with sleeping under the mounds of the cemeteries that they worshipped. Their hunger for reputation replaced Christ. Jesus said, wake up. Become alive again, strengthen what remains. If you act quickly, this can be salvaged. Jesus says in, in verse 30, remember, therefore, repent. Heard, we've heard, obey it, repent. <laughs> repent. <laughs> Jesus says, repent of the forgetfulness of the truth that you learned. Repent of complacency. If you don't wake up, I will come like a thief, Jesus says. Jesus declares the consequence of failure to repent. Jesus' judgment will come suddenly, suddenly. If we put off repentance another day, we have another day with more stuff to repent of and a day less to repent in. What do you need to repent of today? Because someday will be your last day on this planet to repent. Will you search your heart? 
search your heart and see where God needs to clean it out. Some in Sardis fueled vibrant faith and walked intimately with God in verse four. Some walked worthy of Jesus, dressed in white robes of purity and victory. In verse five, it says their names will never be blotted out of the book of life. See this death and life comparison. The permanence in the book of heaven would resonate because Sardis would remove Christians from the town register. And Jesus will acknowledge them by name before the Father. They're not forgotten by God. They are a part of, of, of life, the life of God. As part of a victory parade, generals would stand before the emperor and praise each deserving soldier by name. Heavenly citizenship and recognition by God is all that matters. And this is what Jesus does for us. Scripture applied refocuses our view of eternity, and revival brings life to sleeping Christians to restore a deep sense of God's nearness. And then out of that springs a vivid sense of, of sin, a hatred of sin that, that God helps us do heart-healthy exercise to repent, to praise, love, and worship. So are you exercising your new life in Christ? All right, on to our church in Philadelphia. Think about a key. A key is our symbol there. In 8090, Philadelphian Christians were marginalized without influence. They were powerless and persecuted for not bowing to the emperor. Jesus enters their desperate situation and captures their attention and shows Philadelphian Christians true power, true love, and true significance. He says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. His key confirms Jesus is the only way in. When only way in. Only Jesus determines who enters the kingdom. If Jesus says go in, then you are in. If Jesus says go in, you are in. Verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Eternity is secure because Christ secured it. I know you have little strength, he says, but you've kept my word. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. This is hard for Christians in this world, isn't it? But these Philadelphian Christians showed it is possible to live faithfully without denying loyalty to Jesus. They resisted conforming to culture. In verse 9, Jesus points out true love. He says, I will make those who are a synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews but are not, I will make them come and fall at your feet and acknowledge I love you. These people who try to get people to turn them away from Jesus are going to one day acknowledge that Jesus loves them. The synagogue of Satan is divisive. And they're divisive Jews who... Uh, who deny that Christ was the promised Messiah. And Christ used these Jews to, Satan used these Jews to cause confusion about who God's people are. And so Jesus says, I'm going to make them come and admit that I love you. Has someone told you that God won't love you because of things you've done? Has someone perhaps marginalized you because you believe in the Bible and believe in God? Jesus' love for you is unbreakable. It is shouted from the cross. It is recorded in his word. It is whispered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' love inflames faith, not by fixing our situations, but by inviting us to take one more obedient step to see life from God's perspective. One step closer to God to feel the love of permeating God. In verse 10, it says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Over and over and over, Revelation calls for hupo meno, patiently endure. Trials are a part of Christian living. Jesus on the cross proves we must embrace endurance theology and abandon exemption theology. Jesus comes into our hardship and limits our suffering. But he says, hold on, because this is how your faith grows. Hold on, in verse 11, so that no one will take what you have. I'm coming soon. 
No one, hold on to, no one can take your crown. It's not a salvation reverence, but it's a crown of rewards. Crowns that will one day put at Jesus' feet in eternal worship. Jesus says, the one who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Jesus is saying, unlike these broken, faulty temples that crumble by forces of nature, they're in an earthquake zone, you're completely secure in my kingdom. And when I come back, the whole world will be shaking. But you will stand strong with me. You will stand strong with me. Jesus doesn't eliminate the struggle. Our world will still be quaking. He empowers us with endurance and the promise of eternity. The last church in our circle is Laodicea. It's a wealthy church. Deep roots of Paul's investment of faith. In verse 14, Jesus reveals he is the one. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise of God, the faithful and true witness. Jesus says, I know your deeds in verse 15. I know you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. We've seen that elsewhere in scripture, don't we? Jesus illustrates the, the church's spiritual problem with the city's well-known water problem. <laughs> water problem. Through a 10-kilometer aqueduct, the Hierapolis piped down hot mineral water, while the Colossi city provided cool spring mountain water. And so by the time the water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm and disgusting. <laughs> and Jesus warns them in verse 16, because you are lukewarm, like your water, you're neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out. I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. Their lukewarm apathy makes Jesus gag, makes Jesus want to vomit. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. The Laodicean church completely ignored Jesus's call. They were the exact opposite of Jesus. Jesus, the faithful and true witness. The Laodiceans were faithless and fake witnesses. So Jesus corrects them in verse 17. He says, you say I'm rich. I have acquired wealth. I don't need anything, but you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus sees them, sees you and me for what they are. They were so satisfied with their wealth they ignored God. Self-satisfaction with a superficial life reveals great spiritual poverty. A life without sacrificial service makes God sick. And so Jesus counsels in verse 18, buy from me, Jesus, gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. Put salve on for your eyes and so you can, you can see Jesus says, live obediently as a servant for Christ. Live obediently as a servant for Christ. These white robes of Christ, purified from the inside, our sins washed away, followed by righteous deeds that bring him glory. And I self to help them see true spiritual condition. In verse 19, Jesus again says, repent, repent. Jesus' love means he will not abandon complacent, self-reliant people. Repentance is always options, an option for us. He pursues us with discipline. So we repent and return to the only reliable source of life. In verse 20, Jesus invites them, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That is such a good verse to remember, a great scripture to write in your heart, a beautiful picture of Jesus knocking at our hearts. You've probably seen that in a picture. Often this verse is an invitation for unbelievers to trust Jesus as their savior, but um, in fact, a long time ago, our pastor said this was a verse that brought him to faith in Jesus when he was a young adult. And so I wrote his name in my Bible 15 years ago as a reminder to pray for our pastor's daily renewed faith. But as uh, a Bible student, so we, we know we, these letters are written to believers. And so sharing a meal, and in the context of this, uh, sharing a meal was the height of friendship. And Jesus says, you're doing church, but I'm outside the door. Let me in. I am the I am. You need my presence to, to do church, to be a body of church, because you cannot fulfill your purpose without me at the center of your worship. 
Now, now the reward is verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I've overcome and sat with my father on his throne. The promise of forever, the promise of serving and reigning with Christ in his kingdom. What a surprising turn for this church, right? They went from the, the biggest rebuke to really the greatest reward. That's what God does for us. No matter your situation, the greatest reward is there. Will you treasure the invitation to sit on God's lap as he rules from his eternal throne? Jesus, he says this powerful line, just as I was victorious and I sat down with my father on his throne. He says, you, you say you believe, then you must serve. And don't be satisfied in, until you're glorified. That's that's what we get to look forward to. According to Jesus, repentance and faith go together. So what thinking that's contrary to God's instruction are you holding on to? Are you holding on to something that isn't what God has commanded? Our loving, gracious Lord Jesus holds up the mirror of scripture to show us truth about ourselves and how kind of God to lead us to repentance when the, his light in us is, is blocked out by our sin. We can't be ambassadors of his light if we've put the light out in our own lives. Will you let his triumphant, powerful life shine through light, shine through your life? Here's what I pray you believe. Jesus will help us to know that faith in Jesus ignites repentance and sparks fireworks of revival. Faith in Jesus ignites repentance and sparks fireworks of revival. Will you please pray with me? Lord, we love knowing that your saving work on the cross through your death and resurrection has redeemed us for all eternity, for, for all of us who, who trust this incredible good news. But we're so thankful that you don't leave us there, that you don't leave us to, to fall back into living out this life without purpose. Instead, you've called us to be ambassadors of your light to the world. And so. We do ask your forgiveness when we extinguish your light uh, by our sin, when our sin uh, goes unconfessed and, and builds up in our, in our hearts that blocks out the, the call of you, Lord, the, the direction of you, the, the delight in you. We thank you for this incredible gift of repentance that with just a whisper, you will clean out our hearts and you will make us new in you. You will, you will let us be restored by you. We thank you, Lord, that, that as we navigate this life into all of the darkness, and, and sometimes we stumble into our own darkness, Lord, that you are always beaming light into our lives. So we, we plead with you to help us be people of, of daily, hourly repentance. We love you, Lord. It's in your great name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.